Hi guys, and welcome to Charade Inc. I'm Dell, and I am here with Jay Schiffman, the founder of Choose Your Struggle and the host of the Choose Your Struggle podcast. We're going to be discussing the untold history of the drug war and how its history is baked in racism. Hi, Jay, and welcome. Can you tell uh, us more about yourself and the origins of Choose Your Struggle? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me. I, I, I truly mean this. It's an honor to be here talking this topic. I, I uh, this is a this is a passion for me. The the the, the what we call the war on drugs uh, more accurately can be called a war on people, specifically a war on drug users. Uh, and, and it really is something that I care just so deeply about. Uh, I am Jay Schiffman. I'm the founder of Choose Your Struggle, and I am a storyteller, a speaker, and a podcast and event host. Uh, but, but really, I think importantly for this discussion, I am a guy in recovery. I'm, I'm 11 years in recovery. Uh, I have a degree in psychology and have spent the last six years uh, doing this work, which has uh, included getting a bunch of certificates in, in sort of uh, advocacy around these topics uh, on cannabis, on um, uh, harm reduction techniques. I mean, you can see the whole list at my LinkedIn. It's not that important. The point I'm trying to make is not only is this a passion for me, but this is something that I uh, do you know, wake up, get out of bed every day and commit myself to working on. So uh, really, really a pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm uh, excited for this conversation. Great. That's great to hear. And congratulations. I know that recovery is a difficult process and each day adds to that achievement. So definitely <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate so, it. So before we dive into the history that's not talked about, let's go over some of the widely accepted facts on the start of the drug war. So in the 1960s, drugs became a symbol of youthful re rebellion, social upheaval, and political dissent. And the government halted scientific research and they decided to stop evaluating drugs, medical safety, and the efficiency of it. And in June of 1971, President Nixon declared a drug, a war on drugs, and he dramatically increased the size and presence of federal drug control agencies and pushed through measures such as mandatory sentencing and no knock warrants. And public concern for illicit drugs grew in the 1980s, largely due to how the media was portraying the smokable form of cocaine dubbed crack. And once Ronald Reagan came into office, his wife, Nancy Reagan, began a anti-drug campaign and did the slogan, just say no. And George W. Bush, he also saw a rapid escalation in militarization of the police force tied to the drug war. And the previous administration, the Trump administration, also threatened to take us back to the 1980s style drug war. And his, the wall was even tied to keeping drugs out of the United States that was coming in from Mexico. And he also wanted to resurrect the disproven just say no messaging aimed towards youth. Now, this is the commonly accepted narrative on how the drug war started. However, it did start well before that. Jay, when did the war on drugs <laughs> actually start? So here's what's so fascinating about that that short uh, summary of the war on drugs you just you just told. None of it is wrong. Uh, in fact, it was all it was very well done. However, uh, that is as you said the sort of accepted version. Uh, it is as we say the tip of the iceberg. The war on drugs in this country, and because of the U.S.'s outsized influence on the rest of the world, the, the the really the war on drugs that we've seen the world over actually dates back to the late 1800s in this country. Uh, the very first anti-drug law was passed in San Francisco, and it specifically outlawed a type of opium. Now, to be very clear, uh, this was not the type of opium that you would have found in a white person's medicine cabinet at the time. That that type was fine. The type of, of opium that was outlawed by the very first uh, drug law in this country was actually the smokable type of opium. And they specifically did that because it was the type preferred by Chinese immigrants. Uh, now, 
We can debate a lot of things in history, obviously. It's kind of open to interpretation. However, those of us who are passionate about the history of the war on drugs are super lucky in the respect that many of these early laws, the racism was baked into the laws. It's right there for you to read. Uh, For those that it wasn't specifically in the law, the conversations around passing the law are what we would just be aghast at the the level of racism uh, that that are around it. And and you see that until roughly 1950, when uh, under uh, Eisenhower, we start seeing more uh, of what we would kind of consider uh, dog whistle uh, uh, politics. But but until then, I mean, we have a solid 60 years of overt racism being the foundation for uh, the war on drugs. And, and, and in, in fact, when we think of the birth under, under Richard Nixon, all he did was give name to something that was already going on. In fact, Richard Nixon never even said the war on drugs. What he did say was that uh, drugs should be public enemy number number one in this country and uh, the newspapers and the media being what they are, they came up with this phrase, the war on drugs and kind of ran with it. And I actually just finished a really fascinating art, a, a book about how, if it wasn't for the media, the war on drugs would have failed. Or, or, or I guess I should say that this campaign that has become the war on drugs would have failed in the first five years because it, quite frankly, Nixon was making something out of nothing. There really was not much there. Uh, but the media loves talking about this. They still do. And they took this and ran with it. And, and now here we are 50 years later with, uh, with this campaign still going. Yeah, and one thing that I always found strange about it is, in one respect, the media creates the perception that everyone is doing drugs. But on the other hand, you know, when a politician says we need to be tough on drugs, they also run with that, too. It's like, well, if you stop creating the perception in these politicians' minds that everyone is doing drugs, then you wouldn't have all these laws to combat a problem that's not happening. Yeah. So let me give you a really amazing example of that point. In the late 19-teens, we see a rash of of kind of what we would now consider uh, the actual foundation of the war on drugs. The, the, the law I talked about in the late 1890s, you see that a little bit on local scales through about 1910. And then you start seeing these national scale drug laws. And one of the, the first ones that actually is at the state level that sort of sweeps the South is police departments push for and are granted uh, uh, licensing and, and um, uh, sort of organized uh, uh, support in, in, in state elections uh, for carrying a, a larger caliber of pistol. Now, they did this. Because the media had run with this story that was flat out fault. It was made up. It, there was not even one example of this being true. But it was a it was a rumor that that made sense to people at the time. That and I, and I'm going to say I'm so sorry in advance. This is so uh, uh, just abhorrent. But there there was this idea going around that black men, specifically men in the South, were taking cocaine and were impermeable, impenetrable to policemen's bullets. Now, we still see this same narrative today. We see this with uh, when, when a black man is shot and the policeman says, oh, but I was afraid. And, you know, what if he was on drugs? It's the same language that was used in the 1910s. Now, what was so scary about that is that, of course, at that time, <laughs> You didn't have to be cute with it. You could say it flat out in the open. Black men are taking cocaine and they're in, they're impenetrable to our bullets. And so you see this this domino effect throughout the entire South as policemen are granted funding for and, and, and pe- the, the permits for carrying a larger caliber of gun. And that still exists today. That we, we The same caliber they still use is dating back to this time. Now, a couple facts about that. Number one, cocaine at the time was in medicine. It's It was still, you know, Coca-Cola. We always hear about this story, right? <laughs> Coca-Cola had cocaine in it, right? So, so there was a public acceptance of it. Also, cocaine, the drug, was getting popular at this time. That is flat out true. However, it wasn't cheap. Now, it wasn't crazy expensive, but you have to think in the South, in the 1910s, most black men flat out could not afford 
this drug. It just was not possible. We know this is Jim Crow era. Most of them, sadly, are are stuck in sharecropping situations or in other low-income vocations. They could not afford drugs. And yet this narrative doesn't, there's no truth to it. As I said, it doesn't matter. It takes off and you see this rash of support for policemen to carry larger caliber guns throughout the South. So that is is my favorite example of this because, number one, like I said, we still hear very similar language today, which is terrifying. But also it shows you how it doesn't really matter that there's no facts in this conversation. If the story is picked up and run with, you will see literal legislation that will follow these made up and flat out racist stories. Absolutely. And going off like how the media portrays it, they definitely portray it as the drug war started with Nixon and Reagan. Why do you think that people just (laughs) accept that narrative and don't actually dig deeper into it? Yeah, that is a uh, a truly important question to address, and 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 the answer. Is, so, if if you are somebody who who sadly thinks that we talk about race too much, you're gonna hate hearing people like me talk about this issue because flat out the war on drugs is is baked baked in racism. The reason that we get this narrative that Nixon kicks off the war on drugs is that for the first time in our country's history, the drug war is not overtly tied to race. Before Nixon, it was one to one. Every, you know, like I said, of course, the example I just gave, which is egregious, uh, that, that black people and cocaine, but, you know, before that, obviously with Chinese immigrants. It isn't until Nixon that they really start to hide this under other language. And so what's so fascinating about Nixon's administration is there's a man named John Ehrlichman who who, who sort of was infamous. Uh, he was one of Nixon's top advisors, and he goes to jail for Watergate. But about 19, I think it was 96, maybe 98, he's, he's at the end of his life, and he sort of is having a come-to-Jesus moment. And he tells a reporter flat out, and you can find this quote, that Richard Nixon and and him, I mean, he was one of the architects of this. They knew that drugs were not a big problem. They knew this. And he said, the reason we did this, the reason we kicked off what is now known as the war on drugs is that we knew, this is his quote, we knew we could not make it illegal to be black or illegal to be against the war. So instead, by associating the hippies with uh, he thinks he says marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both. We could arrest their leaders and disrupt their communities. He says this overtly. It's it's a sort of I realized my sins. I'm coming clean with this. So Nixon knew that the war on drugs was just cover for what the, the country has been doing forever. Right. But but Nixon was the you know dirty trickster. That's how we remember him. And so he can't just overtly be racist. He can't just overtly try to uh, arrest the the leaders of the anti-war movement. So instead, he takes these policies that have worked for now 80 years at this point, and he kicks off what we now call the war on drugs. It was one of Nixon's, if not his best dirty trick, one of his top ones, because it's still going today. And so that's why the media still runs with this narrative, is that before then, it's really hard to defend these policies because they are so overtly racist. But under Nixon, you're able to say, okay, you know, it's not, it may be right there under the surface and anybody who really wants to see it will see it, but it's not overtly racist anymore. We can start recognizing this as the the, the dawn of trying to stamp out the drug problem, which of course it, it, it has never happened and will never happen. Right, exactly. And I think, you know, to add to that, it also gave cover for future administrations to continue the same line of thinking. So it's not that I have to go back to where I am referencing a law that is anti-Asian. I'm just referencing Nixon in this. So you even have the Clinton administration having the 1994 crime bill, which definitely set the stage for continuing the war on drugs and adding increasingly racist penalties attached to it. 
Yeah, in fact, so that's a wonderful point because a lot of times you'll you'll hear people say, "Oh, but you know, let's be honest here. The war on drugs was a, a Republican tool. Not so fast. The war on drugs has been an everybody tool. Uh, that the last two, uh, so the last three, if you want to count Clinton, uh, Clinton, Obama, and 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 Biden have all been incredible incredibly harsh with their treatment of drugs. Uh, you know, o- Obama was the only one who took a positive step, and that was he lessened the, the, the disparity between crack and cocaine um, from 100 to 1 to, I think it's 20 to 1. It might be 18 to 1. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but but Biden was the author of these bills in the 80s and the 90s. He was one of the leading authors. And to this day, he will not apologize. He has said, uh, you know, we may have been a little harsh or whatever, but he will defend his actions writing these crime bills. By the way, Bill Clinton does it too. Uh, there's a really famous, um, you, this went viral when Hillary was running for president, of somebody challenging him about some of the things he did as president, uh, you know, specifically coming up with this term of super predators and just quite frankly, disrupting entire uh, black generations. And uh, he refuses to back down. He says, basically, you don't understand. You know, these kids were on the street. He tries to come up with all this stuff. So uh, it is not a one-sided issue. This is not a just Republican issue. Uh, Democrats have been just as, if not more egregious when it comes to drugs and, and under what they call, quote unquote, law and order. Absolutely. And I think that it's always the misconception that there are two sides on every issue. But there are some issues such as drugs uh, for the longest time, LGBTQ issues, where they basically lined up on the same side. And many people expected Democrats to, you know, work their way over to the left. But People like Biden, people like Hillary, they only say that to give lip service when they want people to vote for them. And then when they're actually in office, you see their tone completely change and they're like, no, we have to keep the status quo. And I think when it comes to the war on drugs, a lot of it has been we need to keep the status quo. Why do you think that is? Oh man, we don't we don't <laughs> we don't have enough time to get into all to, to the details of that. But you know, the, the, I think the the easy answer is that if you look at sort of take a take a, a thirty thousand foot level uh, look at our our situation here in our country, our political situation, and you compare it to other more progressive countries, you know, we have a, a distinctly conservative. Uh, leadership class in this country. And and this is not just around drugs. This is, as you so perfectly said, it really is around most issues. You know, we look at our most um, liberal members of of elected officials, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I'm a huge Cori Bush fan. I think she's incredible. Uh, But these people would be moderates in in other more progressive societies. And yet here they are the farthest left we we have. And it's because they're calling for Common sense things like healthcare, like uh, access to, um, uh, to to harm reduction and, and and good treatment for for drug users. Those are not progressive ideas. They're common sense, moderate ideas in a more progressive society. And 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 so when it comes to these, uh, even things as you just so perfectly said, like LGBTQ, of course we should accept people for who they are and not force them into our you know binary boxes. But unfortunately, this society we live live in is so uh, moderate to conservative that that somebody wanting to be who they are as an individual is a progressive idea. And, and you know, that sort of uh, uh, coloring is really what paints a lot of the way we talk about these issues, because we get caught up in this dynamic of, oh, you know, you're calling for something that is just too progressive for the society. No, it's too progressive for our really conservative society that we live in. But that doesn't mean it always has to be that. That way. Right, exactly. I just remember the latest two headlines to come up since the weekend. One was in New Zealand, where they're going to send the first transgender woman to the Olympics. And of course, in America, it's this big hoorah. Oh, you know, they are misgendering her. But in New Zealand, you have the prime minister congratulating her. You know, you have the political class looking at, you know, yes, we are the country that's doing it. They're proud of it. And I always think when comparing our political structure to someone like the UK, 
the conservatives in the UK look at our moderate conservatives as too right wing. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. there's just certain things that Tories, which are the conservatives in the UK, they're like, of course we should have national health care. <laughs> what, what do you mean? How How is this a debate? <laughs> you know, it just goes to what you're saying. Um we are definitely, I would say, a center right country when it comes to those that actually make the decisions for us. Yeah, and I think we're we're living in this moment that so perfectly articulates that, which is where we've we have made as as it should have been for a long time, uh, Juneteenth a national holiday at the same time that you are seeing this push on the state level and, and now getting to the federal level to ban teaching of slavery in schools. And, and, and of course, they they coach it through, oh, they're trying to make our kids hate America, which is great A bullshit. But, but at the same time, there is no better, I think, uh, picture of our country than making this thing a holiday finally at the same time we have to defend the right to teach why it's a holiday right so so yeah you know when it comes to talking about things like the war on drugs and and accurate or, or, or ad, um, uh, adequate uh, treatment for for drug users and 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 those struggling with substance misuse you know it is important to remember that we are that uh, a lot of the things seen as incredibly progressive are not that at all. They're absolutely common sense. Uh, and, and, and the, the sad thing is, as I said, I, I did a Ted talk a couple of weeks ago, directly tying the history of the war on drugs to, um, the, the way that we do not act, uh, adequately treat people struggling. Now, you know, Common sense and facts have never been a part of these conversations uh, to the beginning. You know, it is based in racism and hatred, and we're we're still arguing about these things today. Absolutely. And one of the things I want to ask you is, how do you think corruption has influenced the drug war? Yeah, that's a that's a really important topic. So, you know. There are a lot of things that are not outright corruption. Um, of course, corruption is a major piece. I think the best example of this I can give is uh, I, I interviewed a, a, a leading voice on um, criminal justice from inside the police department. This was a couple of years ago. He is a policeman or actually a, 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 um, a guy who tours around in his uniform, former Marine who talks about how we cannot arrest our way out of this. Uh, definitely a leading voice on this. And he act, asked me once, he said, um, if you had to guess what percentage of drugs uh, that come into this country uh, make it into people's homes, or, or, or another way to put that is what percentage do law enforcement uh, catch? And I said, I don't know, man, maybe 30% can they catch? He went three to 5%. I said, excuse me? He said, the law enforcement of this country catch three to 5% of drugs that are coming in, which means if you're good at math, uh, <laughs> that, that 95 to 97% of drugs make it into users' hands. So if you hear that and you still think that we can arrest our way out of this, I don't know what to tell you anymore. That is, that is literally not true. So, so the fact that, that police are still able to advertise, you know, that this is what they do. They stop drug. No, you don't. Your own people are saying, no, you don't. Right. So, so is that corruption on a, on a, like a micro, a micro scale? Not at all. Now, is that corruption on an absolute macro scale? You bet your ass it is, you know, that, that we are allowing these narratives to drive funding to police centers um, were allowing this this deal that was struck in the early 80s called the 10, uh, is it 1088, 1080 uh, bill that this is how police end up with all their military grade weaponry. It was directly out of the war on drugs. It came under Reagan. We're allowing this to continue despite knowing police only get three to 5% of the drugs that that come into this country. So again, it, it, is it corruption in the sense of, you know, I'm going to give you this little money. So you look the other way. No. Is it corruption on a grander scale that is costing billions? Yes. Yes, it is. And what do you think has been the effect on the users of these drugs? The, the way the police actually handles those interactions, because I oh, know that, it's, a lot of awful. the narrative yeah. has been anti-drug user. 
Yeah, so that's super important. Um, I, I want to kind of use an example that I uh, that I like to use a lot, and that is uh, in the in the 1919, very famously, this country passed an amendment to the Constitution after moral crusaders convinced uh, our leadership that alcohol needed to be banned. Right? We know this era now is prohibition. And during that time, we saw literally the exact same thing that we see today with drug use. A couple examples. Number one, uh, you could not just buy it anywhere. And so a lot of the alcohol was smuggled in from across the border or it was made in people's homes. Uh, now, obviously, what happens when you're making this shit at home? Uh, it's going to hurt you. It's not it is not a clean supply. It's not a safe supply. And so because of that, the the um uh, the, the issues, the health consequences that rose from people drinking tainted alcohol exploded. Right. Also, criminal justice uh, or, or, or the crackdown on drinking caused a giant spike in, in arrests uh, and, and the, the organized crime took over. It directly mirrored what we're seeing today and accurately and smartly, we got rid of prohibition. We were like, wow, this is a <laughs> massive failure. And we got rid of it. Why have we not done the same thing with drugs? Because forever, forever. Ever the narrative has been, as you correctly just said, that only degenerates use drugs. Right? We talk terror. We talk about the the way we talk about drug users is appalling, and it leads people to be seen as others for doing the same thing that everybody else does. There was a study that was released not long ago that is now being just uh, trumpeted everywhere, and that is that the average drug user, if you if you kind of line everybody up and, and and do you know averages is a middle-class white man. And yet, when you think about drug user, what comes to your mind? It's not a middle-class white man. It's either a poor person begging on the street corner or it's a black person. That is done on purpose. That is That was the, the point of this, was to associate drugs with a, a, a other element, a criminal element, right? As I said earlier, every single drug law uh, up until about 1950, maybe even a little bit later, uh, directly that was the goal. It, it was to, to it was out of fear of this other. Um, you know, we saw that in like as I said with cocaine, but we also see it with uh, right around 1920 with uh, marijuana. When we first get our, our first real mar- anti marijuana laws, it's not because white people are using it. It's because they are terrified that Mexican immigrants are bringing it into the country. Was there any proof to that? No. In fact, marijuana, the word was made up at this time to scare people into thinking this was a a crop that was being brought in from Mexico. It was called cannabis until then. That's why you, you hear a lot of people still calling it cannabis because marijuana was a word that was made up to intentionally sound Mexican. Now, of course, a lot of people still call it that without knowing its racist history. And so you know, there, there really is not a lot of people that will get uh, angry with you or something like that if you call it marijuana. Uh, but, but these are important things to know because this has been going on for over 100 years. It's why we treat drug users so terribly. It's because we've been taught to treat drug users so terribly. And yet, you know, if, if instead of, uh, you know, growing cannabis at home, you're growing uh, hops or you're mixing beer, you just are thought to have a hobby. Why is it any different? If if I grow weed, if I grow shrooms, I'm a degenerate. I'm a drug dealer. If I am mixing beer at my house, ooh, that's cool. I want to try it. That's awesome that you do that. So so this is the, the this is the separation that we need to fix. Uh, and, and this is, I think, the, the 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 clearest example that it is all in the narrative because, quite frankly, that the three most lethal substances are all legal. They the the no matter how you cut this data number of people they kill every year, the number of harmful effects their use causes, the uh, number of, of, of people who suffer adverse effects, no matter how you cut this data, those three legal substances are nicotine, liquor, and sugar. And yet we spend all of our time focusing on drugs, which not that many people use. And it's just because <laughs> of these narratives. And I think it's always strange how politicians try to attack drug users. 
And it definitely is always tied into race, what drugs they care about at the time. So when they thought it was immigrants, it was reefer madness is coming to take you and to take your children. And even now, when you look at, I'm in New Jersey and we have a lot of recovery initiatives, but it's not focused on drugs typically used by minority communities. It's focused on the drugs typically used in suburban communities. So namely right now, heroin and prescription drugs. And I always thought that it was so strange that race even has a factor on who gets the resources to recovery. Yeah. So there is a reason that the world and and specifically this country are finally caring about addiction. And it's because the last drug panic, uh, opioids, were mostly white people. Uh, I mean, you know, you can, there are people who try to explain this a different way. Uh, Fortunately, most people who do this research are like, yeah, that, I mean, that's it. You know, during, during the, the, uh, the, the panic of, of um, crack in the eighties and early nineties, during the panic of heroin in the nineties, uh, those, you know, crack was, was seen as a black person issue, even though quite frankly, if you look back at the data, it was also just a, as much affecting white people. This was the narrative that it was a crack. It was a crack, uh, crack was for, for black people in the nineties. Heroin was very closely, uh, uh, connected with grunge with, uh, sort of the underground element, you know, Kurt Cobain was a heroin user, that kind of thing. And people didn't care. You know, this was an issue, of course, but there was no giant funding push. There was no, uh, you know, presidential uh, investigation into how we can do better treatment. It wasn't until white people and white middle class people started dying because of the opioid epidemic uh, and the panic that surrounded it that we saw a a mass movement because uh, and, and here's what's so sad, you know, during this panic, there were just as many black individuals that were struggling with opioid use disorder uh, and, and overdosing because obviously, as we know, addiction can affect anybody and it it crosses all superficial boundaries that we create for ourselves. And yet, you know, if you look at the the stories, even some of the most incredible books written about this period, it's all the same person. It's the high school quarterback who gets his knee blown up, is put on, uh, you know, some kind of an opioid before switching to heroin. That story is the one we focused on or or the the grade A student who, who you know, gets her teeth pulled and puts on uh, gets, gets Percocet or something. And next thing we know, she's she's, you know, uh, finding heroin in the street. Those are the stories we focused on. Now, are those stories tragic and real? Of course they are. Are they the only stories from the opioid epidemic? Absolutely not. Uh, this is a an issue that affects everybody, and yet we continue to focus on that group, and so sad, but that's why there was finally movement. Uh, now, I, I have hope that now that the world has sort of opened up uh, their eyes to this issue, that we're going to see continued uh, focus on this, and we're going to see continued focus on incredible life-saving tactics like harm reduction uh, ideas, like needle exchanges and safe consumption sites. You know, those are my hopes. Uh, is it is it likely? I don't know. I mean, history would say no, uh, but I, I think that we're in a situation now where now that our eyes have been opened, it's really hard to go back. Uh, because during this epidemic, you know, it, it was as high as one in four uh, people were struggling in, w- with s- substance misuse in some way. And once you have that, it might not be you, it might not be someone you're related to, but it might be your neighbor, it might be that person that you see every week at church. And because of that, it's really hard to forget those images. And, and so I really, uh, I do have hope that we're, we're sort of uh, through, through that looking glass and we can keep pressing on with getting people who deserve help, the help they need. Absolutely. And why do you think that there has been a big emphasis placed on making sure that nicotine and alcohol stay legal? while things like weed stay illegal? Yeah, there's one really easy answer to that, and it's one word, and it's money. Uh, the the Nicotine is such a fascinating story because uh, it was for a while 
the, if not number one, the number two industry in the entire United States behind, I think it was behind auto, uh, automobiles. And, and big tobacco was called big tobacco for a reason. These were multi billion dollar industries in the 80s and the 90s. And then you had something that we just do not see that often. You had leaders willing to stand up to them. And here's what I think needs to be said about this episode. What is so important about standing up to the big tobacco was not trying to shut down cigarettes. If you want to smoke, I mean, I, I think it's gross. I don't smoke, but do your thing. Like that's, that's fine. That's part of being an adult in society. Now you should know what's in your cigarettes. And that's what we saw. We saw a push to number one, make it a huge penalty. If you were caught selling to minors for, for stores, which is super important. And number two is that these places had to label what was in their cigarettes. Now, Take a step back for a second and say, why can't we do that with everything else? Why can't we, you know, we would have so fewer overdoses if people who were thought they were buying heroin weren't buying fentanyl. Or actually right now, I live here in Philadelphia, the the latest one, I just learned about this over the weekend, uh, people are buying heroin and thinking and finding out there's this really potent tranquilizer in, in, in their heroin. And why this is so scary is that you've got people like myself and, and others that, that do this work who go out with our Narcan, right? Which, and, and if you don't know what Narcan is, it, it's the, the drug that helps reverse an overdose. And so if for, for opioids specifically, so if somebody is an overdose and you shoot them up with Narcan, uh, you can bring them back. It's a life-saving drug, but the people who are uh, high on this on this uh, heroin mixed with trank, uh, tr- what they call it trank, but but tranquilizers are th- th- the effect is mimicking overdose, and so people like us go out. And we think, oh, God, this person's an overdose or even just their friend will go, oh, God, this person's an overdose and give them a Narcan. Now, Narcan is a very um, unpleasant experience if you're not acting. Well, first off, as someone who lived through overdose, it's the worst feeling, worst thing you'll ever have in your life. So obviously, if you're afraid somebody is an overdose, always give them Narcan. It's better than the alternative. That being said, if you're not actually an overdose, it's a very unpleasant experience to be ripped back out of your high by this drug. So this is, I just heard this over the weekend. I was doing outreach and somebody said to me, I'm not narcaning people anymore because of this experience, which was an absolute eye opening to, to me. Um, that doesn't answer your question at all. I just found that crazy fascinating. But the, the answer to your question is money. If, if It is because uh, these industries drive huge amounts of money. Um, alcohol, obviously, is probably now, if not the, in the top three, very close in terms of industries in this country. Um, and we're seeing that with cannabis. I mean, the, the rise of, of, of legal cannabis has been unreal. And it's because uh, after Colorado and, and California legalized and all of a sudden, you know, it, we saw headlines all over that California was actually giving people tax dollars back because they made so much money the first couple of years in legal cannabis. And so, of course, all the states look around and go, wait a minute. <laughs> so you're telling me I'm spending billions of dollars to make this thing legal while you're making billions of dollars to, on this thing? I'm doing this wrong. I'm going to go that direction. And so it's not surprising that all but four states now either have medical or legalized cannabis. I think if you and I did this conversation again in 2025, uh, not only will all states have it legal, but we'll see varying degrees of uh, different industries that have spawned from this. I I, I think at this point, it, it is too late to try to turn off that tap. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And but uh, besides weed, what other drugs do you think should be legalized or at least have it regulated for medical use? Yeah, well, I, I'm a person who believes in legalizing all drugs. I think that we're, we've seen this, that, that illegal drug use or uh, drugs use still happens. Uh, as, uh, obviously, if we legalize and we regulate, you know, when was the last time you saw a, a 13 year old open their locker and show their buddy, hey, man, look at this, I got a beer, you know, it's a lot harder to get 
uh, these drugs that are legal, like like um, uh, alcohol, and you're seeing that with uh, with um, cannabis, where where illegal use is dropping because you know it's so easy to get it legal now. Um, so I do believe in legalizing and regulating. I think that important part of that is a safe supply, and and that's what you see right now in cannabis. I will say, however, the one that I'm watching the closest, which I think everybody should be watching, is uh, psilocybin. For those uninitiated, uh, those are commonly known as magic mushrooms. Um, what you're seeing with psilocybin that I think is so incredible is that for literally 50 years, if not more, people, specifically researchers and, and therapists, have been saying this is a drug that can be used in therapy. This is an incredibly medicinal drug. And of course, the government was saying, no, 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 It's just that whatever. Well, all of a sudden, you're seeing two, you've seen two places, Washington, D.C. and Oregon, that have legalized psilocybin for, uh, re- for, for uh, treatment use and have de- decriminalized it overall. Um, it, it is the stories that are coming out about this are absolutely fantastic. I think personally, the ones that are the most compelling are uh, there's there is a, a treatment center in uh, D.C. that is specifically using psilocybin to help uh, black individuals uh, sort of address in themselves uh, the generational uh, like not illnesses, that's the wrong word to put it, but but traumas of uh, racism in this country. And the stories that are coming out about this are absolutely mind blowing. I mean, tears in your eyes reading about these people who under, under uh, treatment with psilocybin have like talked to their ancestors and have like, I mean, it's just incredible. If you haven't researched this, please do so. And if you don't, if you read that and don't believe in the legalization of this, again, I don't know what to tell you, but, but that's the next frontier on this um, specifically for, uh, research and therapeutic properties. Uh, are we going to get to a point where I think that'll be legal too? I, I do. I think we're heading in that direction. The the early stages that we're seeing right now almost directly mirror the first couple states that legalize cannabis, especially on for medicinal uh, properties. And so I do think we're heading in a direction where you're going to see um, things like, uh, well, really all psycho psychosomatic um, uh, treatments, you know, whether it's MDMA even or, or, uh, LSD, but, but specifically we're going to start with, with psilocybin. And, uh, I, I don't think it's that far off. I mean, like I said, you, in the last year you had two places, uh, decriminalized and legalized for therapy. So, uh, I look forward to trying it myself as a person who, uh, very strongly believes in microdosing. I do microdose on occasion and I think it's wonderful. Um, so I, I do think the psilocybin is going to be that next, next big for Frontier. Can you explain to the audience what microdosing is and how it differs from other forms of intake? Yeah, definitely. So microdosing is just literally taking a small, a very small dose of anything. You can take a, a microdose of, of, you know, alcohol would just be a sip, but it wouldn't do anything for you. So there are some things that even a small amount will still give you uh, sort of medicinal properties. You, you hear about this most commonly uh, with psilocybin. It's that's the number one. LSD is number two, and cannabis, uh, specifically edibles, are, are number three. And the, the the quality you're looking for here, and sort of to put this in, in perspective, what this means, a typical um, enjoyment if you're trying to trip and have the sort of uh, life changing or mind altering experience of enjoying psilocybin is anywhere between three and a half, or I should say about two grams to four grams, depending on how strong you're looking to have of an experience. Microdosing is about one a point one five grams, so we're talking a very small amount. Um, and 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 the way I can describe it, or the way that it does it for me, because everybody's a little bit different. Uh, some people it really boosts their creativity. I know that this is kind of what you hear about the most is, is the CEO who, who takes a little bit of, of, of psilocybin or, or, or even um, LSD in the morning and, and goes to work and just has the most brilliant ideas because his mind is awake. You know, what you're hearing, of, th- I mean, that's pretty common, but what you hear about even more common is people where it just acts as sort of a shield. And, and, and to put that, to kind of help you understand that, uh, you know, I, last time I microdosed, which was over the weekend, actually, uh, I, I took a very small amount to the point where I felt nothing. I mean, that's that's kind of the goal. You shouldn't you shouldn't feel high. You shouldn't feel um, any effect from taking this. And I went out with my wife 
and we had a wonderful day and normal experiences that would have caused me a little anxiety or would have caused me a little um, frustration. Uh, in those moments, I kind of just let the experience flow off my back, right? I didn't do that purposefully. It just happened. And that's because this little bit of psilocybin that was going through my system sort of acted as a shield so that these 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 feelings like anxiety, these feelings like frustration couldn't take over my brain. Uh, now, as a guy who struggles with anxiety, as a guy who has OCD, uh, those things, when they happen, can be pretty strong for me. I mean, they can really ruin a moment. They can ruin an afternoon. Uh, and that does not happen when I've, when I've microdosed because I have this buffer. Uh, now, I'm, I'm reading a fa fantastic book right now. It, it's some, called something like How Microdosing Saved My Life and My Marriage. And it's all about a woman who um, she, she was a therapist and she could not conquer her, uh, the, 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 some effects that once were called bipolar and then, you know, well, it's just really bad mood swings until she started microdosing and it completely changed her life and her mood was just much more stable. Now, obviously, is this going to be the case for everybody? No. And in fact, there's been studies that show if you are a person with pretty severe, uh, mental health struggles, this is not for you because it can exasperate it. So this is something that um, I, if this is something you're interested in, I would recommend doing some research. I would also recommend, uh, if you have somebody in your area who is somebody like a, um, uh, a psychedelic coach, uh, those do exist. I had one of my podcasts earlier this season, really fascinating. Uh, his entire job is helping people integrate psychedelics into their life. So, uh, definitely do not take my word for it. Um, you know, I, as somebody in recovery, I know that I'm in the minority of people who, who still, would use substances even though I'm in, uh, I'm in recovery. Uh, however, uh, psychedelics are not addictive uh, would, and, and neither is cannabis. Despite what you may have heard on Fox News, cannabis is not addictive. Um, and so there are things you can use safely uh, and still, and still, you know, if you are a person who struggles with, with that. Uh, but I, I would say if this is something you're interested in, uh, definitely uh, do your research because it's out there. I mean, this is the thing that's been around, like I said, for 50 years, and it just wasn't until recently that our government was even willing to hear these, these explanations. Right. Exactly. Definitely very important for anything that you're taking, whether it be currently legal or illegal, that you do your research before putting something in your body. Um, and taking it back to our main topic of the war on drugs and it's baked in racism. What are the solutions to help solve this problem? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. So um, there's a couple things, and, and 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 I say this every time that it is really easy to be overwhelmed because there's so much that needs to happen that it can be it can be really like oh man, there's just so much I don't even know where to start, right? But there are a couple things that that we can do from square one. Number one, if we teach kids honest and fact based education about drug use, we will save lives on day one. This is something that every researcher agrees on. This is not a, oh, well, what if we try? No, no, no. Every researcher agrees the very first thing to do is honest and fact-based education for kids. Let me give you a couple examples. Number one, uh, in the late 1990s, and I'm 30, 35, so you know, this was when I was a student, we shifted as a country, we began to shift from teaching abstinent only to, to safe sex uh, lessons uh, in, in schools, right? And in the next decade, teen pregnancy rates plummeted by almost 75%. <laughs> and so we're like, wow, why did that happen? Well, uh, it's because teaching kids about safe sex, despite what you, again, I'm going to keep harping on Fox News here, despite what you heard on Fox News, does not make kids want to have sex. They're teens. They already want to have sex. So if we teach them how to do it safely, those lessons stick with them for the rest of their lives. It's time we did the same thing with drug use. If we teach kids uh, just say no or dare BS, which is what we did until 2010, 2012, they are going to keep using and they're not going to know what unsafe use looks like. They're not going to know what addiction looks like. If you want proof, it's me. I struggled with addiction and didn't even know it because I didn't know what addiction looked like. So if we teach kids 
uh, how how to use drugs safely. And, and that is, look, we know you're going to use. By the way, you shouldn't use. You should wait until you're older. There is enough research that shows if you use any kind of substance before you're 15 years old, your chances of struggling with addiction more than quadruple. So, so kids, if you're listening, just don't do it. I mean, I, I know it sucks. I know it sucks. I used drugs when I was a teen. Don't do it. You're going to struggle with addiction. However, we know you're going to use drugs. So here's how you do it safely, right? Here's how you know what unsafe use, uh, use looks like. Here's how you know what addiction looks like. And if you're scared, come talk to us. Can you imagine if we had a scenario where if you were struggling as a 17-year-old with addiction, you could actually go talk to somebody about it instead of feeling like you had to hide it because you're going to end up in jail? Can you imagine how many people's lives would be better on day one if we made that reality? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that when we separate addiction out from other illnesses, that's where we have the biggest problem. Because if someone's stomach is hurting, there's no stigma. They just go to the doctor. They say, my stomach is hurting. I'm struggling. What can I do? But when it comes to people who are struggling with drug use, we tell them it's your fault. You're a bad person. You are in control. And now you need to use that control to fix your life. And that's just not the case. We know that um, illegal substance dependency across the board comes from a chemical imbalance in your brain. And you need to have the same access to treatment as we do with any other condition. And I think it's connected to the stigma that we have with mental health. So it's like mental health is already stigmatized. And now this is a subset of that already stigmatized sector of healthcare. Yeah. So let me take you a step farther. So we know that there is not one or uh, one thing in, in, in particular that causes addiction. It, it's, it's sort of a, 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 an equation. I think it's the best way to put it. Right. And, and, and in that equation, we don't even know how many variables there are yet. We have identified some of them. Let's say we've identified about five, right? Uh, genetics is a huge piece. Um, your, your setting, uh, sort of what's happening in your life is a big piece. Uh, it, it, it goes on like that. There, there are about five variables that we know. However, we don't think those are all the variables. So imagine you're trying to come up with the, the, the answer to an equation where you only know five of, let's say, even seven or nine variables. However, you also don't know the, what per, or, or sort of what power those variables are to. This could be a four in front of that variable. It could be a seven. We have no idea. And yet we are still trying to figure out the answer to that equation. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to treat addiction separately right now. Now, if we ever get to a point where we figured out all of those variables, Maybe that makes sense at that point. If we, for some reason, think, okay, well, let's treat this the way that, um, you know, someone struggling with cancer does, right? Where they go to their doctor and their doctor says, I can't treat this. I'm not a specialist, so I'm going to send you to a specialist, right? What a beautiful situation that would be. We're not even there yet. And that's why it's treated outside of the medical industry. That's why it's treated by special places because we're not even there yet. And yet people want to look down on those struggling with addiction. And yet people want to stigmatize those struggling with addiction. And it's because until very recently, the only voices in the room have been those who say addiction is a moral failing and needs to be treated as such. You know, that's why AA has the higher power. That's why AA's higher power is still, if you read the big book, and by the way, I've read the big book, it says Jesus. I mean, this thing might as well be an offshoot from the Bible. So is there a problem with AA? Of course not. AA is wonderful. It helps a lot of people. But if that is our only answer for a medical problem, boy, are we falling short. I absolutely agree with you. And that's where we're going to leave it for today. Thank you, Jay, for joining me. Uh, can you let us know where we can find you across the internet? 
Definitely. Uh, you can find me at jayshiffman.com, J-A-Y-S-H-I-F-M-A-N.com. The Choose Your Struggle podcast, which is my podcast, drops twice a week. And you can find it wherever you get your podcast. Wherever you're listening to this, just click over before the end of this. Right now, I'm talking to you in particular. Go over and find the Choose Your Struggle podcast. And find me on social media because I do a bunch of live or virtual but live events and uh, those go live on Facebook, LinkedIn, and uh, YouTube. Uh, so, so definitely check those out as well. Uh, but, but you know, I'm all over. And, and I say this whenever I speak. By the way, this is the one thing I always make sure to say. You know, I was in a position in, in when I was uh, 23. We didn't really talk about my story, which is fine. I've told my story enough times by now. But I did the stupidest thing you can do, and that was I gave up hope, and I attempted suicide twice in two days. The second time, I overdosed, and somehow I still lived. I'm not a betting man, but if you were hearing that story and you were putting odds that that person would live, you would be wasting your money because 99 times out of 100, 999 times out of 1,000, that person doesn't make it if they attempt suicide twice in two days and overdose. The, the call that I always say is – there is somebody in your life who will listen. Those of us who do this work for a living, we have a saying that says, uh, we'd rather spend two hours listening to you today than two hours listening to attending your funeral tomorrow. And I say that to say, if you truly don't believe there's anybody in your life who will listen, you're wrong. But if you feel that way, I understand. I was in the same shoes you are. Reach out to me. I've had people reach out to me over TikTok. That's not a joke. Somebody reached out to me over TikTok because they needed someone to talk to. I will listen. I will talk to you. Please reach out. I will be there. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing that. I'm going to be including the all of Jay's links in the description below, as well as wa ways for you to support this channel. So make sure you leave a comment, make sure you subscribe. And thank you again, Jay. Have a great day, guys.